for those of you who don't know, it was a religious holiday, although it's no longer a holiday in South Africa. On Thursday, that was Ascension Day, the day that we celebrate when Jesus ascended into heaven. We looked at the Nicene Creed when we were covering that period of the church in the second to the third century. We saw how it ended in this creed, which summarized the key teachings of the church and how it speaks of the Trinity. It speaks about Jesus being one substance with the Father. And it says of Jesus in this creed, which is a summary of Christian faith, which we still use today, that Jesus suffered. And the third day he rose again, ascended into heaven. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. The quick, by the way, it just means the living. It's an old English term. I know we use quick in another sense nowadays, in case you just think it means you can run fast. Now, when you try to go to another world, there's great danger. Uh, in January 1967, there was a launch pad test of Apollo 1 in the race to see who could get to the moon first, the Americans or the Russians. The Russians had already got into space with Yuri Gagarin, and so the Americans were desperately trying to be on the moon first. And so Apollo 1 in 1967 was to be the first flight of a three-man capsule into Earth's orbit. The three men pictured there. And somewhere in the 50 kilometers of wiring within that capsule, there was a wire that had been stripped of its insulation. And it happened to be near a cooling line. And so there was a violent chemical reaction. And within seconds, flames spread throughout the cabin ceiling. At 6.31 p.m., astronaut Roger Shaffey said, we've got fire in the cockpit. And a few seconds later, the transmission ended with a cry of pain, and all three of those astronauts perished. Two years later, Apollo 11 was getting ready to carry men to the moon, and so obviously they realized that this was risky stuff. People could lose their life, and so the president of the U U.S. at that stage, Nixon, his speech writer, William Sapphire, had prepared a speech just in case there was a disaster and the men never made it or died in transit on the way back and the speech was prepared. And according to the disaster plan that they had, mission control, if there was a disaster, would close down communications with the lunar module and a clergyman would commend their souls to the deep, uh, deepest of the deep. And it was similar to what would be done to a burial at sea if things had gone wrong. Because no one had ever done it before, but thankfully that's not what happened. And so 20th of July, 1969, some of us were alive at the time, including myself. The lunar module landed in the sea of tranquility, not a sea like Earth, no water in it, but Neil Armstrong was the first man to step on the moon. And he made his iconic statement, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. That picture over there is Buzz Aldrin 20 minutes later, not Armstrong, else you'd wonder who was taking the photo. And so these astronauts were pioneers. They were forerunners, first men to do something. First time a human had ever gone to another celestial body besides the Earth. And the return trip took about three days after they departed from the moon and they landed in the Pacific Ocean in a capsule. And there's a picture of the capsule. And they were greeted to a hero's welcome when they returned. They'd accomplished a mission, the mission that they'd been tasked with. They'd done what no man before them had ever done. The human race had accomplished, at that point, its greatest technological achievement of all time. And so there were parades and dinners held in their honor. There's a picture of President Nixon and 
He gave each of them the Presidential Medal of Freedom. It was great celebrations. They'd beaten the Russians to the moon as well. Sign of their superiority in the Cold War. But you know, when Jesus accomplished the greatest act of love and redemption of all time, he also went through the clouds, except he wasn't headed for the moon. He was headed for heaven's shores. And it was also a great celebration. Because he had accomplished a dangerous and the most important mission of all time. Faced every temptation, never gave into sin. He'd given up his life for humanity. And he became the first man who, as a man, would enter heaven in a glorified body. While he was on earth, he could have called legions of angels to rescue him, he said. But he obeyed God. That wasn't God's plan. He fulfilled his mission to give up his life as a sacrifice so that you and I could be redeemed. He defeated the devil. He destroyed death. And so as he goes into heaven, he's returning in victory. And the Father welcomes him. And he's seated at God's right hand, the place of highest honor and given all authority. Now we get the most detailed account of the ascension in the book of Acts, written by Luke, the author of the gospel. And so he starts off by saying, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised. Why did they have to wait? Well, because he had to ascend first, we'll see later on, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He didn't do it immediately. He had to ascend first. The ascension is something that's often overlooked to its significance. We know the cross, the crucifixion was important. The fact that Jesus died, we know the resurrection is very important. But often we don't realize how important the ascension was as well. And so the disciples gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set. Their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? On a hill called the Mount of Olives, the Sabbath day walk from the city. Those of you who've been to Jerusalem will recognize that. That's the Mount of Olives. And that steeple on the top is the Russian Orthodox Church of Ascension to commemorate where they feel Jesus ascended. I don't know that we really know for uh, certain, but we do know it was on the top of the Mount of Olives. So it's in the vicinity anyway. The apostles returned to the upper room to await the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. And so we see they go and they wait, and later on they receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. Why do they have to wait? We'll see shortly. And so the ascension signaled the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. God had sent his son into the world to Bethlehem, and now the son was returning home. And Jesus said, that that was the case. In John 16, at the Last Supper, he said, I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. He said to Mary, go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father. Now that's before the actual ascension, because that was when he went to present himself to heaven. The point is that Jesus' mission on earth was accomplished. And so there was no sweeter reunion in history than his return 
to his father. You can maybe liken it to a soldier who's returning to his loved ones after a hard-fought victory, coming back in triumph. So Jesus said, I'm going to my father. But where exactly did he go? Well, we're told in Mark 16, verse 19, and many other places, after the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. How did Mark know that? Mark obviously got his source from Peter. But why is it that we are told repeatedly in the New Testament that Jesus is at the right hand of God? Jesus said, I'm going to the Father. We've got no record that he explicitly said that. He may have said that. There's no record of it. How did they know Jesus was at the right hand of God? Well, the most quoted verse from the Old Testament in the New Testament is Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Do you know what that is all about? That psalm is quoted 22 times in the New Testament. There's the passages where it is quoted almost verbatim. And there are the places where it is alluded to. And there's other portions of that psalm that are alluded to verse 4 repeatedly in the book of Hebrews. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Why was that such an important psalm? Because that psalm, it was believed by the, the Jews of Jesus' day, by the Pharisees, and not only by them, by Jesus himself, that that psalm was about the Messiah. It's what we call a messianic psalm. It was written by David, but it pointed to a future son of David, the Messiah. And so we find that in Matthew 22, when the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? They say the son of David, correctly. And then Jesus makes reference to the psalm. He says, okay, if, G if the Messiah is the son of David, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? He's asking them a question they can't answer. Messiah is the son of David, but this psalm, which is about the son of David, David's addressing the son of David as Lord. How can you be calling your son Lord? If you look in the Hebrew, because... If you read it in the English, it almost sounds like God speaking to himself. The Lord said to my Lord. But it's two different words. The first, whenever you see the Lord in capitals in most versions like that, it's actually Yahweh, the highest name of God, incorrectly rendered uh, by some as Jehovah. The uh, more correct pronunci pronunciation is Yahweh. It's the highest name of God. The Lord said to my Lord, that word there is Adon, or Adonai. So it is Yahweh said to Adonai because it's such a holy name the Jews wouldn't even pronounce it and when they saw it they would just say Lord because they thought it was too holy to pronounce and we've kept that convention but it makes it a bit confusing in this verse the Lord said to my Lord it's actually Yahweh said to Adonai Yahweh is a reference to the Father and Adonai is Jesus so it is the Father says to Jesus, sit at my right hand. How did they know that Jesus was at the right hand of the Father? Because Jesus would fulfill Psalm 110 verse 1. Yahweh said to Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. In the Greek as well, it's also both words are translated as kurios. So we have the same ambiguity in the, uh, in the Greek and in the English. But if you go back to the Hebrew, two different words there. Remember that. So the Pharisees, to summarize, believed Psalm 110 applied to the Messiah, the son of David. Jesus asks them, well, why would David call his son Lord? Now, they obviously didn't realize that the Messiah was not only the son of David, he was also the son of God, God in flesh. And when Peter quotes that same psalm, on the day of Pentecost, you know how he concludes? After he quotes that psalm, 
he says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. That's the point. He's saying Jesus is not just the Messiah. He's also Lord. He's also not just the son of David, but the son of God. That psalm is applied by Jesus to himself. When he was on trial, the high priest says to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you're the Messiah, the Son of God, because Jesus is remaining silent. Jesus replies, you've said so. But I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, coming on the clouds of heaven. He's quoting from Psalm 110, verse 1, and from Daniel 7. The Son of Man. Both of them were passages which spoke of the future Messiah. The high priest was well aware of it because they believed those were Messianic passages. And that explains his response, which many people don't understand. Why at that response are we told that he cries out blasphemy and he tears his clothes? Because Jesus is saying, I am Adonai, the one who will be seated at the right hand of Yahweh. He's broken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? So why is Ascension Day important? Well, we'll use an acronym, ASCEND, to look at six points of why it is important. Firstly, it speaks of an accomplished mission. Jesus prays to the Father in John 17, 4, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. The task he had been given to redeem mankind had been completed. Remember on the cross, he said, it is finished. Tetelestai, paid in full. And so why was Jesus ascending and leaving? Because the job was done. And so we are told that he sat down after he had provided purification for sins. Mission was accomplished. That was his mission, to provide purification for sins. We are told in Hebrews 1 verse 3, that he sat down at the right hand of the majesty. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, The mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh. This was his task. Was vindicated by the Spirit. Was seen by angels. Was preached among the nations. Was believed on in the world. Was taken up in glory. Taken up, translated there, is the same verb used in Acts 1 verse 2 when it speaks about Jesus ascending. And so should we celebrate the ascension? Well, all of heaven celebrated the victorious return of the Son of God. Mission accomplished. He had conquered sin and death. He says in Revelation 3 verse 21, I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. He could sit down because the job was done. Then the S, he set a pattern for his return. And when he comes back, he's going to come back in the same way that he left. And that's what the angels say. They say, why are you guys looking up? They say, the same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. And so we know from prophecy that when Jesus comes back, that his feet are going to touch the Mount of Olives. They left the Mount of Olives. He's going to come back and touch the Mount of Olives and enter the city, we believe, through the Eastern Gate as he comes to liberate Jerusalem from her enemies. And those times are near as we see the world turning on Israel and she's left with very few friends. And one day all the nations will turn on her and Jesus will come at the end of the tribulation to liberate his people. And so we are told that he will sit at God's right hand until all his enemies are subdued under his feet. David did not ascend to heaven, it says in Acts 2. And this is Peter speaking. And yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet being quoted there by Peter. 1 Corinthians 5.22, he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Again, alluding to that psalm. As in Hebrews 1.13, to which of the angels did God ever say, 
sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Hebrews 10, 12 to 13, when this priest, that's Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. And so, at his return, Jesus is going to execute divine judgment. He's going to vindicate his downtrodden people, and he's going to judge his enemies. And you can see that if you go read the rest of the psalm, I've got most of it over here. The Lord said to my Lord, Yahweh said to Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Yahweh will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, saying rule in the midst of your enemies. Yahweh has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. This is all prophetic of Jesus. Adonai is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge the nations, which will happen at Jerusalem, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. What a prophecy-packed song, if you know what it's referring to. And then the ascension confirmed that he came down. The fact that he went back up proved that he came down. And Jesus said that. John 6, verse 38, I've come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. This is Jesus preaching to the people. And they got offended when Jesus said, I've come down from heaven. Yeah, it was Jesus. who Some of them knew his, his mother and brothers. And that's exactly what they said. It said some of them started to grumble. And they said, how can you say I came down from heaven? Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? They were offended at that. He's saying he came down from heaven, but we know his father and mother. And Jesus says, this is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And that's when many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And listen to Jesus' response. Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? What was he saying? If you have a problem believing I came from heaven, well, wait. You're going to see me ascend back. So the ascension was proof that he came down from heaven. Then exaltation. After his ascension, this allowed Jesus to be further exalted by the Father. He is received in honor. He's given a name above all names. Let's read some of these verses. 1 Peter 3, 21 to 22. Jesus Christ has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. He's given authority, power. Acts 5, 31. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. And this well-known passage from Philippians 2. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, that he's Adonai. I will acknowledge that he's the one that Yahweh said to I don't know. Sit at my right hand. Now, before Jesus came to earth, he had glory. He spoke of his former glory. But that glory was dependent upon his person. But now there's an added dimension, which is based upon his completed work. So Ephesians 1, 19 to 21 says that that power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And so there's a big difference when people see this end of Jesus. Remember when they first saw Jesus off he was raised from the dead, they could look at him. Sometimes they mistook him. Mary mistook him for the gardener. 
and the guys on the road to Emmaus mistook him for some stranger that they were just chatting with. When he appears to Paul on the road to Damascus, which is after his ascension, it's, his glory is like the morning sun. And Paul is blinded. When he appears to John on the island of Patmos, this is not the same Jesus that he lent against at the Last Supper. This is one that when John sees him, his friend, John has to fall down before him because he's dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head, white as wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like blazing fire, the exalted Jesus. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. That's not the way they saw Jesus on earth. His voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held the seven stars, etc., etc., etc. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. And John says that when he saw him, the Jesus that he had followed as a disciple, but now when he sees the glorified Jesus, he falls at his feet as though dead. That's the glory Jesus has after his ascension. And so after Jesus' ascension, he's enthroned in heaven. He'd conquered, sat down with his father on the throne, where he receives unending praise. I won't read that whole passage, but if you're familiar with Revelation, you'll know that the Lamb is the object of praise, where the angels, the 24 elders, um, worship every creature in heaven on earth, give him glory. Then no more limitation is the end. Jesus' limitation was self-imposed. Those of you who've done Bible college in the later years will know that we call that doctrine the kenosis, the fact that Jesus emptied himself. And so it says in Philippians that Jesus was in very nature God. He really was God. He did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness, it says. He was found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself. He became obedient to death. God cannot die. And yet Jesus put aside his prerogatives of God, uh, as God and became a mortal who would be subject to both suffering and pain and death. He had to do that in order to redeem us. God couldn't die. And that's why Jesus had to become a man to die for our sins. And so the ascension spelt the end of Jesus' limitation as a human. When he came as a human, we read that he got hungry, he got thirsty, he got tired. His knowledge was limited. There were times when he say, no one knows the day, not even you know the sun or the angels. His glory had been veiled while he was on earth, with one brief exception at the transfiguration. But he says in John 17, verse 5, at the Last Supper, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. He had laid that glory aside. He was now going to take it back. He's no long, longer limited. Hebrews 2, verse 9, we see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor. And then he delivered benefits for us, is the D. We might say, well, those are all great things, but how does it help me? It doesn't touch my life. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, glory, conqueror, victorious. There's the King of England and his son, the heir. He's got riches on earth, majesty and honor in Buckingham Palace, but makes little difference to us if he were to no longer be the king or they, if they were to do away with kings what would, the difference would it make to us but the same can't be said about jesus jesus becoming king and being seated make a big difference to us what is it let's look at these in our last section how does jesus ascension benefit us well firstly he liberated those who were in paradise in the heart of the earth we know that uh, in Luke 16, Jesus speaks of Abraham and, and uh, Lazarus being in paradise, a place of comfort, but they can see across to 
the rich man who's been tormented. But Jesus liberated those who were in Hades. They couldn't enter heaven because their sins hadn't been paid for. And we believe that's what referred to here in Ephesians 4. It says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives. It's referring to those who had been captive in Hades, the righteous. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions? If you go look at the Greek there, it actually is abyss. He descended into the abyss. He who descended is the one who ascended far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So he liberated those captives. And that's why I can say in Revelation, I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I'm alive forever. And he says, I hold the keys of death in Hades. He liberated those who were captive in Hades. He took the keys and led them in his train when he ascended. Then also, he was a forerunner. We saw how those Apollo 11 astronauts were forerunners. There's other guys who've gone to the moon since then, but they were the first. The first men who walked on the moon. Once they had done it, others followed. Jesus was the greatest pioneer man ever. He was the first man to enter heaven with a glorified body. But he did it so that we could follow him one day. Because Paul says of new covenant Christians that to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. That wasn't possible in the old covenant. In the old covenant, we see they went to paradise in the heart of the earth. They weren't present with the Lord. So our entrance into heaven is only possible because it says in Hebrews 6 verse 20, our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He went in, made atonement for our sins in the heavenly temple. And he became our example. Colossians 3 verse 1, since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Hebrews 12 verse 2 says we must fix our eyes on Jesus. He's our example the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see what I mean? That that passage is alluded to so many times, even when it's not directly quoted. And then he inspires us to be victorious, to be overcomers. Because in Revelation 3 verse 21, Jesus says that the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. He's promised that one day we too will rule and reign with him in the same way that as a man he sat next to the father. Then his presence. We are told that when he was ascending to heaven in Luke 24, I won't read it for the sake of time, that he lifted his hands and he blessed his disciples as he was being taken up into heaven. And some believe that maybe that blessing included the last words that Matthew records. Because it's recorded that he said, I will be with you always to the end of the age. That's a blessing. Jesus has promised, even though he's ascending, that he will be with us to the end of the age. How is that possible? We know from the Bible that even though we can't see Jesus with these eyes, that his presence still remains with us. And his presence with us is possible because of the Holy Spirit. And so when Jesus is leaving, he's saying, I'm going to ask the Father, and he'll give you another advocate, the Spirit of Truth. The difference with the Spirit of the Truth is he didn't come as Jesus, but as a man who could only be one place at a time. And so Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. He said, the world won't see me anymore, but you will see me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. How does he do it? Through the Holy Spirit. And that was only possible because of the ascension, because he says, when I ascend, I'm going to ask the Father if I can send the Holy Spirit. That's why he had to tell them to wait. Wait. Wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit is given. So we might say, well, why did Jesus go back to heaven? Wouldn't it have been better if he stayed? As a man, Jesus could only be at one place at a time. But through the Spirit, he's able to minister simultaneously to all who believe and to convict the unrighteous. 
And so he says in John 16, 7, it is for your good that I'm going away. His disciples are disturbed and upset when he said, I'm going away, going back to the Father. But he said, it's for your good. Because he says, unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So Jesus is saying he needs to ascend so that he can ask the Father to send the Holy Spirit. While he was a man, his work was geographically limited. He had a physical body. So we don't read in the Bible that Jesus was preaching in Israel and also he was healing in Syria at the same time. But today, Jesus works everywhere. He's working in our country. He's working in America. He's working in Europe and Asia, all over the world. Jesus isn't one place at a time because of the Holy Spirit, which he sent after he ascended. And so that's why he said, as we saw, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. He said, just before he left, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And on the day of Pentecost, Peter explains that this was made possible. Remember, that's when the Holy Spirit was poured out. They waited. The Holy Spirit was poured out. And they remember, Jesus said, wait. Can ask the Father. And so what does Peter say in Acts 2 verse 33, when they, they're not too sure what's happening with these guys who are speaking in tongues, he explains it by saying, exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. And so the Holy Spirit lives in every Christian. Because in Romans 8 verse 9, it says, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. We are told that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. Every Christian. Remember, this is different to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling is something we receive when we're born again. And so because of what Jesus did, we are told that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, that he lives in us and he empowers us. To live for God, because in Romans 8 verse 11, it says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. So we're talking about blessings because Jesus' ascension, what a blessing, the promised Holy Spirit, so that we can have Jesus' presence with us till the end of the age. And not only that, the Spirit progressively sanctifies us, making us more like Jesus. He convicts us when we sin. He prompts us to do what God wants us to do. It says in 2 Corinthians 3 that we've been transformed into Jesus' image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. And Galatians 5 speaks of the fruit of the Spirit. Because we have the Spirit within us, we start just as a tree naturally produces fruit, an apple tree naturally produces apples. So when we have the spirit within us, what is the fruit? Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then not only the Holy Spirit associated with that, we are told that he gave spiritual gifts. When he ascended on high, it says in Ephesians 4, he gave gifts to his people. What are those gifts? Christ gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. And they are gifts because they to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We know the other spiritual gifts that are mentioned elsewhere. I'm just giving you a bird's eye view here. And then another reason he ascended was so that he could prepare a place for us. Because in John 14, once again, a well-known passage, Jesus said, my father's house has many rooms. And he says, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Jesus had to ascend as the bridegroom so that he could prepare a room for his bride, the church. Then the other thing that Jesus does because he's ascended is he receives our spirits when we die. Now, all the places in 
the New Testament, when it speaks of Jesus and the right hand of God, it says he's seated at the right hand of God, seated at the right hand of God, everyone except Acts 7 verse 56. And Stephen, while they are killing him, giving his life as a martyr, you know what he says? I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And so people have been curious as to why is it this is the only place that Jesus is not seated, but now he stands. And one of the theories, and so one I believe in, is that he was standing because he was going to receive the spirit of Stephen. Because you read a few verses later, three verses later, it says, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He sees Jesus standing and he says, Jesus, receive my spirit. So isn't that beautiful? Jesus is normally seated. Only time he gets up, he gets up to receive the spirit of his faithful martyr who's dying for him. What a reception. Then he intercedes for us. So what else did he do besides sitting at the Father's right hand? Well, that same psalm which speaks of Jesus sitting at the Father's right hand is another verse, verse 4, that's repeatedly applied to Jesus in the book of Hebrews, that exact same psalm. And it says, verse 1, the Lord said to my Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh said to Adonai, sit at my right hand. And it goes on to say in verse 4, Yahweh has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And that's why that's applied to Jesus. Because that's that same Messianic Psalm. Jesus became, of the ascended, our, our priest. He continues his work. He's our heavenly mediator and high priest. Hebrews 8, 1 to 2, the main point of what we're saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary. See, they had knowledge of these scriptures, the writers of these books. The true tabernacle set up by the Lord, the tabernacle in heaven. And so Jesus didn't ascend to take a break. He was just changing his job description, if you want to put it in human terms. He successfully completed the task of dying on the cross, but now he takes on the role of a priest to intercede for us because he's paid for our historic sins, but now he has to intercede for the Father and because we keep on sinning even when we get saved, don't we? While we were God's enemies, it says in Romans 5 verse 10, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? What does that mean? It says we reconciled to God through his, uh, the death of Jesus, but it says we saved through his life. It's speaking of his life now because he's interceding for us. Isaiah 53 verse 12, prophetic of Jesus, said he poured out his life unto death. He bore the sin of many and he made intercession for the transgressors. And so he needs to keep on interceding. Hebrews 7 verse 5 says he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. That was the whole argument of why Jesus was a greater priest than Aaron, why he had a greater priesthood, the priesthood of Melchizedek, because he never dies. He lives forever and he always intercedes for us. 1 John 2 verse 1 says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Now, why is he the best possible intercessor? Two reasons. He's right next to the Father. We've seen that. He's at the Father's right hand. He has his favor. He has his ear. He's his 2RC, you could say, once again, in human terms. And so Romans 8, verse 33 to 34 says, Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Who's going to bring a charge against you? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of, the, of God, and he's also interceding for us. So the whole point is, is at God's right hand, right next to him, and he's interceding for us. He's got the price of privilege. He prays for us before the throne of God. 
Now, it's wonderful, you know, when you find out people are praying for you and perhaps you're having a hard time. But how much more to know? Yeah, we're told that Jesus is praying for us. He's our advocate. And he's with the Father when we sin. He intercedes for us. Then the second reason is not only does he have a place of privilege, he understands us. He knows what it's like to be a human, and that's what we are told. So he's not unsympathetic. Hebrews 4, verse 14 to 16 says, Since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, his ascension, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So Jesus is sympathetic. He knows the reality and the strength of temptation. And so we are told in that context, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I not only have someone interceding for me who is right next to the Father, I have someone who actually understands me and who is sympathetic to my weakness because he was, well, he still is a man, but he walked the earth as a man. So let's sum up. What does the ascension mean for our lives? And I just want to read the short piece from DesiringGod.org, which summarizes a lot of these things that we've gone through. Though often overlooked, the ascension completes Jesus' earthly mission and signifies his enthronement as heavenly king. Jesus has completed his father's mission and in our rules with all authority and intercedes with all sympathy as our mediator and our priest. Remember that Jesus is presently reigning as king and remains active and engaged in our world and our lives. Therefore, live boldly, confidently, and strategically as servants of the exalted king of heaven. Know that your labors in the Lord Jesus are not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Sufferers, take heart that Jesus is not indifferent to your struggle. He has endured great suffering. And he's thus the most merciful and sympathetic counselor and mediator. Take your cares to the ascended Lord who hears your prayers and can respond with all heaven's authority. And so to sum up what the ascension means for us. Sorry, I went backwards there. <laughs> Instead of forwards. Finally, Hope in a glorious future. The ascended Lord we see is going to return as judge. He is seated at the right hand of the Father until all his enemies are made his footstool and put under his feet. He will abolish injustice and suffering. There's a day coming where the injustices will be dealt with. He will destroy death. He will set up his kingdom of truth, righteousness and love. And best of all, we will be with our King forever. Amen.